Well, thank you for coming to the seminar series here. Uh, I just want to remind you of um, we'll be having uh, uh, a revision to the schedule I gave you a few uh, uh, weeks ago. So uh, it's a dynamic scheduling. So we will be uh, having some uh, uh, rescheduling there and having new speakers uh, come in. So, but it will be very exciting. I just want to remind you today before we start, we have uh, this REEU for the undergraduate student for wastewater, uh, on-site wastewater uh, 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 fellowship for the summer, we didn't have enough uh, applicants. So we extended the deadline uh, to, uh, for, for another four weeks. So please encourage uh, some of your students to apply for it. It's a very uh, interesting, uh, uh, what you call it, fellowship with, uh, good uh, five weeks fellowship. They will have a free housing, $2,500 of, of uh, free money, uh, paid lunch, paid uh, food, etc. And our speaker today, he will uh, try to sell you on this because he will show you what great things we do with the student. Uh, so uh, I, I encourage you to uh, help them. And it's from May 29th to July 3rd. So uh, before that, uh, I would like to <clears throat> introduce our speakers today. Uh, our speaker is Anish Gentrania. He's an uh, associate professor and also uh, associate extension uh, specialist from uh, Texas A&M University uh, Department of uh, Biological and Agricultural Engineering. And he's, host, uh, he's uh, uh, in Blackland Research and Extension Center in Temple. Uh, he has been... Um, in the area of wastewater, on-site wastewater treatment for uh, over 30 years of experience working both in West Virginia and uh, Massachusetts in Virginia, uh, both in the university and also in the industry uh, 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 area. So uh, he joined us here uh, uh, six years ago. So uh, uh, and he had been working together on, this is the second project, we have been working together on our EEUs for our undergraduate students. It has been tremendous help for us and for our students when we would like to continue this partnership with our colleagues in College Station. With that, I would like to open the door, I mean the podium for you and uh, we'll have a, a good talk today. Can just talk. <laughs> I, I I forget. I was here what three years ago, and I forgot the format. So, anyway, good morning. Everybody can hear me, right? Should I turn this on? Let me check with the mic to change the mic. Move around a little bit. Okay, good. Um, hopefully, uh, we'll this hour we'll spend um, uh, talking about water. Uh, that's what uh, I do. That's what Dr. Ferris uh, and I work together. Uh, at AM. Uh, actually, well, like almost five years ago when we met first time. And I always appreciate his support. He was like the first investor in our program at AM when I was new and looking for some seed money. And guess where it came from? Prairie View. So thank you. <laughs> so um, again, I'm uh, primarily employed by these two agencies AgriLife Research and AgriLife Extension. They pay the bills. Uh, but I'm also a faculty at BAN in agriculture engineering. Uh, I'm, I'm an agriculture engineer uh, by, by trade, uh, but I, so I tell people I'm an Aggie outside Texas, not inside Texas, because I did not go to a and I just worked there. So uh, this seminar was mainly designed for students, uh, and, and we, I gave this seminar several times. So I was in India last year, talk about this uh, in India. One of my colleagues was in Mexico City last week. Uh, we gave this talk over there. So uh, it's designed to encourage students to come uh, work in, in water. A simple outline. Uh, uh, you know, we will talk about the challenges. I'm sure you're all familiar with it maybe uh, at, the, at the national level. Um, and then it, what's happening in Texas. Uh, we'll talk about opportunities. All the challenges to us are opportunities, of course. Uh, we'll then focus on wastewater reuse. <clears throat> That's uh, my area. That's what we do, and especially on on-site wastewater reuse, which is for single-family home. And then we'll talk about REU program a little bit, and then and then open it up for discussion. Okay, I thought if there are student here, I will always start with quiz, obviously, <laughs> and it's always interesting. 
Oh, very good. Okay, well, then we'll quiz you. <laughs> well, the first question is, you know, I'll always ask people, as they, are we running out of water? You know, I mean, obviously, uh, not now, but when I came to Texas in 2014, we were like, oh, we're running out of water. You know, it was dry and everything. And, and, and some students still say yes. And I said, really? Uh, you know, I didn't hear that. So we, we spent about half an hour talking about why we're not running out of water. Anyway, uh, then the second question that always get attention to people is like, how much water we have? So I throw this picture out and, and typical answer we get from students, a lot. Well, I said, well, how much is a lot? You know, what's, what's in the gallons? Have you ever measured water in gallons? And since we're in engineering, we, we said, try to quantify the numbers. <clears throat> and then we, we move into this chart that comes from a USGS website. It talks about amount of water. I'm sure uh, most of you in the audience, you're probably familiar with this number, uh, 332 million cubic miles or, or so. So then again, we get into the unit conversion or like what is, what is a cubic mile? So one cubic mile is 1.1 trillion gallons that translate that number to about 366 million trillion gallons. And it's always fun to ask students, write that number down for me, please. How many zeros are there? <laughs> and that's when the wheel starts cranking. Uh, we give them a little cheat sheet. And this is what it looks like, 366 million trillion gallons, 18 zeros after that. And then I teach them a little handy thing. I was like, you know, you want to impress somebody. How do you remember this number, right? It's a big number. You don't have to worry about that. I said, well, think about a leap year. How many days in a leap year? There you go, 366. And then just impress your audience that million trillion and go with that. So that kind of attracts students' attention. And then, you know, because it's a huge amount. Obviously, no, not a, you know, 97% is in ocean, which is salty water, but they're still there. And the interesting fact is, this was the amount of water before human came on this planet, and it'll be the amount of water after we all disappear. So water will be here uh, after we are gone. So, so we don't have to worry about running out of water like oil. Uh, and there, there are a lot of fun facts. We have, uh, you know, we do this program uh, at a and for undergraduate students as well as for high school students. I think we have uh, this 4H2O program uh, that attracts a lot of high school students and, and we get into these fun facts about water. Uh, many things from EPA website is for kids. Um, the fun part of this is the water from your faucet could contain molecules that dinosaur drank. And then we get into discussion of what kind of wastewater treatment dinosaur had. You know, so, so it, it, it gets uh, and then thinking about the age of the water, a uh, little basic chemistry. We will not bore you with that because this is, again, mainly for student. Uh, but uh, we start with that and we have a pop quiz again, how much water, we go with that. Anyway, long and short of uh, the quantity of water is not a problem. Um, that's the good news. However, uh, it's all about infrastructure. So I don't know how many, I'm sure some of you probably seen this chart uh, from ASCE, American Society of Civil Engineer. Uh, they normally give grades to all the infrastructure. And then we try to uh, get attention to the infrastructure for drinking water and infrastructure for wastewater. We all know it's aging. Uh, the grade of D or D plus uh, doesn't look good on anybody's report card. Uh, so that's, that's the big challenge. Uh, this is, uh, aging infrastructure problem. Um, and then there is, it, it, it's a good presentation by ASCE. Uh, let me just play. I have three video clips so that you don't get bored with my sound and you get a little uh, flavor from some, uh, some other places. So let's take it. In the water industry, we provide 24 seven reliable water. It's unlike any other industry. You can go anywhere in this country and you know that the glass of water you're about to drink is safe. Although the quality of drinking water in the U.S. remains universally high, pipes and mains are frequently more than 100 years old and in need of replacement. There are an estimated 240,000 water main breaks per year. Costs to replace drinking water pipes over the coming decades may reach more than $1 trillion. We have old, decrepit pipes. That is a, a, a problem nationwide. These were all put in around the turn of the century. Cities were forming, were building these systems, and for decades, there didn't need to be replaced. We just had a pipe that we replaced this year that was 1875. 
I mean, that, that's incredible to me. You can only repair them for so long before you have to start replacing them. It, it's important to renew these structures, and it's important that we do it in a manner that is least disruptive to our customers and the taxpayers. We are the fundamental resource that every single job, every single building, every single residence relies upon. During heavy rainstorms, century-old sewers in many U.S. cities combine domestic wastewater and street runoff to pour untreated sewage into our lakes, rivers, and coastal areas. There are a number of things we can do to raise the grades for wastewater and drinking water systems. Our industry has to be so much more aggressive and assertive and customer-oriented. We're doing everything we can think of to communicate better with our customers, even when there's a problem. Here's what happened, here's why, this is why solutions are needed. We need to look at public-private partnerships for both water and wastewater. We also need to look at some federal programs, such as an increase in our state revolving fund. The level of federal support for improving this infrastructure on a national basis has really declined. And that's despite the fact there's federal mandates driving a lot of our work. But at the end of the day, the users need to reconnect and invest in this system because they're the ones that are turning on the tap every day. And they have to agree that if they want the quality of life, if they want the economy they've enjoyed, they're going to have to make that investment. So that's, uh, that's a pretty sobering reminder about uh, what's happening with our beautiful uh, water and wastewater infrastructure. Now that's at the national level, about trillion, I mean that number is going up and up every year. Uh, I was in DC last two weeks ago and they were talking about now two trillion dollar worth of need or something. I don't know where they generate this number, but it's in trillions of dollars. Uh, looking at every state, in Texas alone, uh, the need for in the next 20 years is, you know, about 50 some billion dollars. Uh, so that translates to employment. And, and that's uh, it's a, it's a pretty good uh, place to work. I personally am working in this field for 30 plus years and enjoying it. Um, and another in interesting aspect is uh, just like infrastructure, even the workforce is aging. So there is, a, there is a tremendous interest both at USDA and EPA to bring in new generation of uh, uh, people, professionals in this industry. So that's translate uh, into some of these challenges. Uh, the demand for water is increasing, as we all know, uh, compared to the supply in our own state. We do have quantity, but it's about the quality issue. Uh, so how do you make the water quality acceptable uh, and the infrastructure that is sustainable? Those things are our primary concern, along with the pricing. Uh, it, it's always interesting to see when people talk about how much you pay for water. They said, well, why do we have to pay for water? Uh, at least in this country, in our country, we, we value water a lot more than in the country uh, where I was in India. And there, people always think that water should be free uh, because it's, it's God's gift. So why don't we have, why do you have to pay for water? So the pricing and the value of water uh, is, is, is not manageable right now. So that needs to be talked about. So that translates to the opportunities that we get into, and one of the opportunities that we mainly focus on is what we call alternative or engineered water sources. How do you make that uh, unusable water usable? And we'll talk more about that uh, using some of these advanced uh, water treatment technologies, wastewater treatment technologies uh, that, that we are playing with uh, on campus and uh, at A&M. And then, of course, uh, we, we have a whole different presentation. I don't know whether I've talked about that or not, but uh, this is the model that uh, we, uh, my personal research project is on SIWI, which stands for Sustainable and Integrated Water Infrastructure. Uh, that's, a, that's a different concept. Uh, we have a talk on economics and water education. And the bottom line is uh, all this translates to a biggest opportunity for young students today uh, in terms of employment. Uh, lifelong employment in water industry is a real thing. Uh, this morning, we'll focus only on the top two things uh, because the rest can, can take pretty much a day-long seminar. So uh, let's move on on this topic, what we call engineered water sources. Uh, and that's focusing on this one particular topic, wastewater reuse. I'm sure some of you, um, we hear about this term, direct and indirect potable reuse go into detail a little bit on that, and then we'll primarily focus on this on-site or individual home level uh, 
water treatment systems. And then, of course, the other two uh, concept of rainwater harvesting and atmospheric water harvesting, we are still in the very early stage of investing in, in that area. We are also working on desalination uh, with some other faculty on campus. So we will not focus on those two things for this morning. Um, let's talk about wastewater reuse. Uh, the way it's defined, it is, it is the practice of using treated wastewater or reclaimed water for beneficial purposes. Uh, in Texas, uh, it's now in the code. The TCAQ rec recognizes many, many beneficial purposes, including uh, irrigation uh, on, on the residential or urban scale, uh, yard, playground, parks, uh, irrigated with treated wastewater, agriculture irrigation, uh, crop production. Uh, I was in uh, San Angelo, Texas. Uh, anybody from San Angelo? No? They are actually the municipality selling water to farmers the reuse wastewater. So it was very interesting for crop production. Uh, fire protection is another use. Car washing, most of the car wash now have built in reuse water system. Uh, manufacturing, concrete tanks, uh, I'm in on-site industry, septic tanks are manufactured using reuse water. Uh, toilet flushing, which is the indirect sort of reuse. But finally, the portable reuse, which is uh, the concept of yesterday's wastewater, today's drinking water. And that's called direct portable reuse or indirect portable reuse. So these are some of the examples, and, and they've been codified now at TCEQ. They have standards for this thing. So it, it's, getting, it's getting pretty interesting uh, out there. In terms of portable reuse, which is for drinking water or, or try to bring uh, reuse wastewater into the dwellings, either for drinking or for flushing toilet, uh, things like that. And then there is an indirect portable reuse, which is sort of treated wastewater discharge into your sub water supply, the reservoir uh, or pond or something like that, that kind of goes through some environmental treatment before it gets picked up for, uh, for drinking water again. So that's indirect portable reuse. Uh, this is an example. I don't know whether I showed this video here last time I was here or not. But when I came to Texas in 2014, that's when Texas was towards the tail end of the drought. Uh, but at that time, we didn't know it was going to end or not. So if you're familiar with this community, uh, Wichita Falls, uh, you probably heard this example. So what was happening in Wichita Falls, they, they, their demand is about 10 million gallons per day. Uh, they have two lakes. They supply their water. Uh, so they would just pick up 10 million gallons, process it through a water treatment plant, use it. Uh, treated the wastewater and discharged the 10 million gallons to the river. That was what's going on until this is what happened to their lake. The lake literally dried out uh, and they were really on the verge of shutting down the city because there was not enough water. Their supply was dwindling almost to 50%. And uh, there is a very interesting story if you haven't seen this video. The city made this video uh, up, uh, let's see. If I click this, will it work? Oh, let's see. Oh, try and mirror video. <laughs> Didn't show up. Let me try this. Hold on. Ooh. Oh, hold on. I think we're going to switch. Yeah, help is on the way. I, <laughs> well, I will need to change the screen here. Somehow it didn't work the second time. Hold on one second. Yeah, I'll, I'll just switch this. Right? right there. Hold on. This, this, I, this video, the city made this video just to encourage people to understand how uh, they can uh, stay normal uh, or, or get their water going. Uh, no, this one, the third one, right there. Yeah, yeah. But we have to pause that first, right? If one percent of the state is in that exceptional drought category, but one of those areas is right around Wichita Falls. 
As Wichita Falls residents struggled to conserve water at home and on the job, the city was sending more than huh. 7 million mm -hmm. gallons of water from its wastewater treatment plant that had already been treated with four... It's always interesting to see how this different system work. It worked perfectly just a few minutes ago. I think it, uh, oh. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Sorry, okay, we'll, we'll skip this. So let's go to the meat of it, no problem, I, I can. Well, well, I'll tell you the story on behalf of the city. Uh, it, it's a very powerful video where they show how a uh, city literally spent almost hundreds of million dollars to, to bring that wastewater uh, back into the water system. Hold on, let me go back. I do have some pictures right there. Okay. So uh, long and short of that story was they had the lake drying out. Um, so they actually, what they did was a pretty interesting concept. Their supply was about 50%. So they took that 5 MGD and, and then mixed it with the 5 MGD of yesterday's wastewater. The wastewater, they captured everything, went processed to the direct potable reuse system. They had membrane filter, they have reverse osmosis, UV disinfection, chlorination, everything. So the math worked pretty well. They would take that sewage out of 10 million gallon of sewage, they would take about seven and a half million gallon, put it through their advanced water treatment, wastewater treatment facility. I mean, this was pretty good quality water to begin with, but they will process it through RO and every available technology. And then they will bring that processed water back to their pond, which is next to the drinking water supply treatment system. So that's how they get five million gallons of highly treated water then they will mix that with their natural lake water, and then that whole 10 million gallon will go through again their water treatment facility. So extreme caution, very well done technology, pretty expensive obviously, but gave city back to their 10 million gallon demand. Very successful projects, I was there, I was new back there, and I was like, I have to go see it. I, this is, I've never seen a city scale direct portable reuse system. So there's June Wolf, my colleague. We were both there. We spent a day over there. They took us. They showed us the, every technology over there. Pretty impressive technology. Uh, and, and the city literally survived. So they used this facility for almost 18 months till the middle of 2015, from 2014 to 2015. And finally, the rain started coming down. And so they, they, they determined this because it's, it was very expensive to operate. So that water was very pricey. Uh, so in order to balance their book, they turn it down. And what they now have is, is uh, I think I have the lessons learned there. Uh, it is possible. This is, I think, the third city in Texas. Uh, they, they did this. So it is quite possible. Very interesting story uh, that I get to hear from the city manager. Uh, they were all afraid of health, obviously. You know, people think about this and like, I'm gonna get sick, but they had the public health people involved. Uh, there was only one case where somebody tried to complain, but medically they were said, no, it's not because of water, it was something else uh, ca causing their sickness. Uh, uh, and they were very expensive. So they implemented now indirect particle reuse. So now they take that water instead of discharging into river, they're putting back into the lake, their water supply system. So it becomes an indirect particle reuse but they are ready to go back to direct portable reuse anytime. So this is what it's going to take for our infrastructure to be drought resistant, is to be able to build this hardware, keep it ready uh, when you need it. So looking at that, I say, well, um, if they can do it on the city scale, can it be done as a single family home? Now, in the state of Texas, uh, this is the homes that are not connected to sewer, like this remote area or villages or, or rural area, uh, they have what we call septic system, or in Texas it's called OSSF, on-site sewage facility. Uh, this is a conventional septic tank drain field, pretty low cost to operate. Of course, there is a reuse here, just you're getting your yard. Uh, but some of the homes now, they're built in an area where they cannot use conventional septic system. So they actually have a secondary wastewater treatment plant uh, 
uh, and, and they have aerobic treatment and a spray field. So the spray field is just these four or five pipes come out and then they spray to get uh, the highly treated wastewater. So the secondary treatment uh, is already there. So the question we are evaluating, can we have that secondary effluent converted to some kind of a drinking water process uh, that can be used for about two, some two million homes in Texas can, can be ready for next drought. And the reusing uh, wastewater in the home at, at the small scale has a lot of challenges. Uh, we identified, we had several meetings on main campus and people came up with technical, economic and social challenges, mainly social challenges, which is the yuck factor, NIMBY factor, not in my backyard, not for me kind of thing. And of course, cost, uh, who would operate it, trust, can we trust this technology? So in order to find good answers and, and, and raise the awareness and everything, uh, uh, we decided to start this uh, NEFA project and, and whatnot so that we can collect uh, some of the data uh, point that we need uh, in order to move this industry forward. Uh, fortunately, at a and we have uh, on our Relis campus, we have about two acre uh, of our training center that was built in early 90s by my predecessor, Dr. Lasseker. And back there, they did a lot of research on those aerobic treatment systems. Can Texas use that as an alternative conventional septic tank? So we have that facility that we are now retrofitting with uh, new technologies like membrane. This is a small individual home membrane system right here. Uh, we're looking at this little box here that gets dropped into the tank, which is an activated sludge tank. So now you have activated sludge with the membrane for a single home, just like for the city. Uh, pretty, pretty high-end technology. So we installed that about three years ago. Um, that's us, that's our REU project first year. So uh, in our center, we, it's on the Relis campus, so we have access to real sewage. This is the campus wastewater that we use uh, it comes in our tank, we process it, so that's what comes out of the membrane filter. Pretty high-end product, uh, pretty much like rainwater, although it, it has still nitrate and phosphorus and everything. So the question is, uh, can we take this wastewater and uh, about 300,000 homes, by the way, uh, they have this kind of system, not membrane, but pretty good quality water coming out of their activated sludge system. Uh, can, can we process this further to make it drinkable? What would it take? But this is almost 90 plus percent pure water. Uh, what, would, what more technology we need uh, to, to bring in drinking water quality? So that's, uh, that's the, uh, of course, nobody has this right now. And our goal is to figure out, can we get to that stage and what will it take? So the concept then becomes, uh, in terms of a concept drawing, this is what a single family home a conventional uh, layout looks like they take water from the well, they use it once and put it out on their septic system and it goes away. Well, if you integrate some of this reuse technology, uh, we believe that uh, not just reuse wastewater, but rainwater harvesting and, and all that new water can be closed loop about 80% reuse. So the same supply can serve three to four homes because now you have more water available uh, at, at your home scale and and if not then it for a single family home it becomes more uh, drought tolerant kind of thing so in order to have this particular device what would it look like and that's the focus of our uh, on-site research going on so at our center we have now all this technology pretty much uh, in work we have uh, ro technology we have uv disinfection ozone chlorine activated carbon we, we are trying out this capacitive deionization, FDI type technology to recover, um, to remove the nutrient, and of course, distillation. Uh, the students actually get to see this in operation. Uh, they, they look at the water quality coming out of these technologies and then try to understand the difference. And we are also working with TCEQ uh, to understand what would it take in terms of uh, regulatory reform uh, to, to to make this kind of technology available, not now, but maybe within the next 10 year time period. So, so that's going on. That's the focus of our, what we call RWQ, reuse water quality, uh, reuse water quality research and extension experience for undergraduate. Uh, our 
current funding will go till 2022. Uh, we have a website, r e e u b a n tamil.edu, and it's pretty much hands-on training uh, type activity we do uh, at our training center. Uh, if you haven't been to our training center, do come visit us. Uh, it's on Wallace, uh, about 20 minutes outside our main campus. Uh, here's just some pictures from our last year. We get students from your campus too. Uh, they all come out there. We teach them how to collect samples, how to do some field scale analysis. They work in the lab, on campus lab, to do some bacteria analysis, nitrogen analysis. And now uh, we also take them to a conference. So that's part of the whole program. So last year we were in Houston for one day where we get to actually, students get to put together a booth. Uh, people can come, they had fun. Uh, so they enjoyed that. And our last year project, kind of went something like this. So we took the raw wastewater. Of course, the first step is membrane. So that was tank two. Then it goes to some very low tech, what we call a bucket technology, which is nothing but an activated carbon in a, in a bucket form. Uh, no energy required, it just filters through the bucket. Uh, so they look at that example, all the way to distillation, where we took this water and put it through a distillation unit. Um, we took this water, send it to ozone. From ozone, we take it to RO and capacitive deionization. So this complicated diagram, but ultimately they just number it. So that's tank two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, it goes something like that. At the end of the day, uh, they get to take the picture. So as you can see, right from MBR, the quality, you don't see anything different look-wise, but we put it under the microscope trying to understand the difference in the water quality. And then students get to put together a chart like this, uh, where they said, okay, if MBR, and we come up with some formula to calculate the treatment level, well, we analyze the reduction in BOD, TSS, organic carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, those kind of things, bacteria. And then they go from this to ozone, to capacity deionization, to reverse osmosis, and the distillation, which is, of course, the highest level of treatment, as we all know. Uh, and with the higher level of treatment, the energy consumption, we allow students to measure the energy, see what it takes for, for kilowatt hour per gallon. All these things, they, they create some data, five-week program, and they do generate good amount of data. Uh, and then we, they put together this chart. Uh, last year, we actually, we had good uh, fun doing some uh, di digital presentation of, of this concept, and all our students make video uh, at the end this is required by the grant also. So here's the video from our last year student. If you haven't seen it, this is limited pollution. Contaminated. Gray water. Dangerous. Waste. Our project topic was to study the effectiveness of an on-site wastewater treatment train operating on the Relis campus for removal of organic, nutrient, microbial, and chemical contaminants to achieve direct potable reuse water quality, i.e. to reuse or not to reuse. We the students conducted field observations of water quality parameters including dissolved oxygen, pH, nitrate, chlorine, and conductivity readings. Water samples were further analyzed at the HEAP lab on the Texas A&M campus for total Keldahl, nitrogen, ammonia, nitrate, chloride, turbidity, and microbiology including total coliforms and E. coli. The Water Quality Research Extension and Education for Undergraduates, or REEU, was established to provide undergraduate students interested in agricultural science or environmental agricultural engineering hands-on learning experiences in water quality through extension activities related to on-site sewage facilities. Sustainable. Necessity. Possible. Our program has been renewed until 2023 with similar course design and content and, following the program, paid internships will be awarded to two students per year. 
My experience was full of wonderful discoveries working with innovative technology and having a once in a lifetime opportunity meeting industry professionals. I had a positive experience with the REEU and I was able to learn something new of how water is an important and growing industry. I have enjoyed my time at this REEU program mainly because it exposed me to many different types of things. For example, before I came here, I had no idea of anything about wastewater. But now I have a very good grasp and I think about it every time I get a drink. So that's, that's the key point right there. The people need to think about water every time you know, they drink, uh, take, a, take a drink out of the tap or whatever. So it, it was pretty good and as Dr. Ferris says, uh, uh, we do have extended the deadline. Uh, as we understand, students do take time, and uh, but so till March 27th is uh, the, our current deadline for this year program. They do get stipend, and they have housing, and of course we don't say it's free because they do work hard. <laughs> and and last time uh, students did appreciate that. I think first couple of years they were getting bored because first we thought it was a half day program, but now we're making it a full day program. So they do stay busy from 8:30 to pretty much 4:30 p.m. Uh, every day five days a week, and then they have fun doing it. So I really don't know what this does, but Janie Moore, who is our colleague, uh, professor, she said, you just take a picture of this and it'll take you to the website, which is kind of cool. So uh, long and short, um, uh, this is, it's a good opportunity funded through NIFA, um, and now we are going to expand it on it. Yesterday we had a big meeting. We want to in introduce actual energy and food component to this project. So we're putting another application this year and see if we can add official energy and food component to our program. Um, we have interest from uh, a university in India. They are actually gonna to pay to send their student here, so which is, which is pretty exciting. So anyway, with that, I think, uh, I thank you for your time. Uh, right now at our campus, there are four of us uh, working on, on different aspect of this project. Uh, but I'm the primary contact, and of course, Dr. Ferris is the contact here. So with that, we'll open up for discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, yeah, Phil, this is a very interesting presentation. Um, so B Bill Gates is very passionate about this whole thing. Uh, is, does this align with what he's thinking about in terms of reusing wastewater and so on? Of course, very much. So one of the video I normally have in my class is Bill Gates' video, where he had invested. He actually built this machine in Seattle, $250 million, where he, because he's very passionate, of course, he's putting billions in Africa to make sure water becomes sustainable and whatnot. So there was a very good video presentation where he talks about reuse water and he actually drinks it. Uh, and there's a communist. So yes, it is very, very much parallel to that. Uh, Gates Foundation focus is Africa, uh, where they are looking at not this type of wastewater problem. They have totally different pro problem there because they don't even have flushing toilets. So they are actually going after uh, treating the human waste, raw waste, and then try to make something out of it. Uh, so that's totally different, but we do uh, educate students that, you know, we have this problem, they have different problem, but it's all related to human waste management and making water available. So absolutely, uh, we, we are thinking, see if we can approach Gates Foundation for some, mm -hmm. some the ground, but they, you know, it's a different topic, but yes, sir, they have. Good, good. Hey, uh, another question, semi-related. But your position is an extension specialist and an associate professor. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, do you teach, do oh. research, and <laughs> can you briefly no. touch upon that? Sure. No, uh, my my position is seventy percent extension, thirty percent research, and no teaching. Uh, so, RU is the only thing that we have five weeks teaching. It's really not teaching, but it's just the classroom that we 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 all share presentations and teaching. So, I do not have any teaching uh, requirement. Uh, but as you know, a and is, is crazily growing fast, so we are all now encouraged to come up with some coursework. Uh, there is a very good textbook that's written, published recently by uh, Colorado School of, School of Mine, one of my colleagues, a good friend, Bob Segrist. He has put together a very good curriculum book 
for decentralized water wastewater management. So I'm thinking because the material is there uh, and one of these days I'm gonna be required to present some classes. So yes, I will get into teaching later on. Great, and please, I would encourage you to do it in collaboration with Dr. Faris and Nawal and some of our own scientists too. Yeah, what we are thinking, have a, a class that can be broadcast remotely or whatever. So yeah, that's a distance learning kind of program. So yes. Good, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we, I, as my extension duty, we teach Texans. So we offer CEU program, homeowner classes. And next week, I, I'm just telling you, I'm sweating because I have a two-day, 16-hour CEU class that's going to happen Monday, Tuesday. 60 people already signed up. Uh, so yeah, I do teach off campus. So. Any other comments? Yeah. Quick question. Um, on the, the, it's related to the filters for your water system. I noticed that it's a patented uh, activated carbon mm -hmm. filter. Right. Can you can you describe it more? Oh, what's it made of? Oh, okay. All right. So we call it a bucket system. It's a very simple technology that's manufactured in Texas. It's uh, two buckets, top bucket, bottom bucket. Bucket has uh, activated charcoal, which is commonly available material uh, that it's packaged in a filtration kind of device. Um, and it removes most of the organic and, and bacteria. So the idea is not to treat wastewater uh, directly, but it's mainly used for rainwater treatment. So if you have a rainwater with some bacteria contamination from birds or something like that, it will purify that quickly. We're just studying it to see what would it do to membrane filter system. And it's very effective in removing those uh, coliform counts. They, they will be filtered out, but it will not remove nitrate or anything like that. So it's not really for, we're just teaching students that in the worst case scenario, what this will do, because it's low energy, there is no energy, it's just a gravitational pull that comes out. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, recently on the news, there was a contaminant in the, in the water, it's called chromium-6. Chromium-6? Yes, ah. you, you know anything? that they're using to remediate such things? <laughs> not such really, water. no, no. Chromium-6, we, we're not looking at that. We did, uh, during this presentation, we found some mercury in our water. It's very low, uh, but mercury and lead is present in the Raleigh campus. So we just looked at mercury and, and lead, and they were, we could remove it with, this. it's all iron. So this capacitive deionization system is supposed to be able to help in that area because what it does is attracts, removes those ions from water, physical, physical removal. So I have not studied chromium-6, no. It's a heavy metal. So if it's a heavy metal, it can be removed with, with that concept. Have you heard about biochar? Biochar bio can yes. be used as a uh, as a kind of uh, treatment for yeah. wastewater management? Yeah, I heard of it and one of my colleagues who is in the energy, he makes bioenergy and the residual product is biochar. And he's encouraging me to say like, hey, why don't we try this? So maybe they'll get on our platform one of these days. I have uh, used, uh, there was another product. It's, it's not a biochar, but it is actual coal, uh, that coal burning power plant. They burn coal, but some of the coal doesn't get burned and they would crush it and make sand out of that coal. It's called black sand or something like that. And it's very good sand for the material for that. So, yeah. How do you think climate change affects water availability? Ah, that's, that's all about climate change and it's the drought and flood. So it's the extreme conditions like we saw Houston recently. You know, flood, water everywhere, not, nothing to drink. So climate change is the big driver. Uh, and the main effect is gonna be on the infrastructure because our current infrastructure, the centralized system is just not capable of dealing with this extreme climate conditions. So the concept is, can we have a robust on-site dwelling-based technology that's built in, into, in, integrated with the current system that will make it more robust during the climate change. So, yeah, but that's a good point right there. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rani. <laughs> There are two main concepts you have just mentioned about 
water pricing and water rights. Yeah, when it comes to water supply from natural resources with all of this treatment, maybe water rights weigh more than the pricing. But in, in a re reuse of wastewater, the pricing issue will raise up, especially in big metropolitan cities like uh, we have those lawn, lawn irrigation and grass irrigation for big areas uh, after this treatment. Uh, my point is there is also issue of privatization in the waters, in the wastewater treatment sector, not only collecting and take it to some place, but with all of these uh, uh, projects and designs, can it be for a private sector can involve in? Ah, <laughs> so that debate is going on for 30 years now, <laughs> as long as I've been doing this, uh, privatizing water infrastructure. Um, in my view, uh, it's still an open question. We look at Europe. Europe is pretty much 80% privatized when it comes to water, uh, whereas US, it's less than 10%. There are not many privatization happening in US for obvious reason, because I think it's, it's a fundamental social thing where we really don't trust private sector uh, the way we trust municipalities. So I have yet to see any big cities privatize their water system. I don't know if there's any in Texas, but on a small scale, it is happening. Uh, do you have, you have subdivisions uh, where they have decentralized small scale utility operating their wastewater water systems, but not on the large scale. That makes sense, do you agree? For there are some cities, municipalities, they are selling the, the waste, uh, the treated wastewater mm -hmm. to the big companies like banks for oh, the sure. to irrigate. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's going on right now. Yeah. But the treatment itself with, with the development of the technology and with the ease, right. and also they, there is another side for regulation, you know, for, uh -huh. from, from the officials because right. We trust the private sectors to sell us our food. Right. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. And, and also we can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, European companies are eager to come here and help us out in, in terms of privatizing water infrastructure. But I don't know. We never say no. <laughs> so it will be a time. It will be a good time. So. Any other question, comment? Thank you. Thank you.